Greenwald. I'm here with my business partner, Patty Gerke, and we wish, welcome you to January 2020, a new decade, and I think our fifth season going into Senior Stay or Go TV. So we welcome you. We're kicking off 2020 with a lot of new and great information. We wanted to let you know that Patty and I uh, will be presenting on the field of life uh, and many places located throughout San Diego County. At the end of this month, we will be in Encinitas, I believe, yep. uh, on behalf of San Diego Planning Partnership. It's a full day uh, and great information to advocate and educate on behalf of our seniors and their quality of life. That's the end of January. And then in April, I believe, we're at the UCSD Retirement Association. In, in April, April also. also, we are at San Diego State for the OSHER program. Lifelong it's gonna, learning it's program. A three, it's a lifelong learning program. Google it <laughs> as a verb. Uh, and it's a three-part series. It's going to be a host of topics. Uh, we're going to have a state planning attorney, private fiduciary, see, the whole gamut on the field of life. Every position will be discussed in depth because it's a six hour program over three weeks. So take a look at that if you want to. And that's the Osher San Diego State University. So we're very excited. Again, for those that don't know us, uh, we are Patty and Ron, and uh, we advocate and educate on behalf of seniors through our Senior Stay or Go and the field of life. So with that said, Patty, please introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Dr. Phil. He is a retired pediatric infe infectious physician Correct. and mm -hmm. a retired Navy captain. Thank mm -hmm. you for your service. And um, Dr. Phil has written and spoken on a number of issues related to health, especially for seniors like myself. And it's we've had a number of conversations that are really interesting because people question, should I exercise? How much should I exercise? What should I be doing? What is best for me? And everybody's body's a little bit different, but there probably are some key things that can resonate through anybody, mm -hmm. as well as diet. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because it's January. New Year's resolutions mm -hmm. usually mean let's lose some weight. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you do that? Everybody thinks if they starve themselves or they go on the keto diet or they go on this diet, it's going to work. And those things are oftentimes very temporary and mm. they don't really work long term because as we've talked it needs to be a change in lifestyle really mm -hmm. um, but we're gonna get started by asking the number one question everybody asks which is should I exercise how much should I exercise what should I be doing and what's best so with that, Thank I you. introduce Dr. Phil. <laughs> you. If you want to say a little bit more about yourself no, as well, please fine, feel Patty. free Thank to. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I love talking about this topic because I see, I see that we have squandered the legacy that we have had. And what I mean by that is the human body is designed to exercise every day. A year ago, the Scientific American had a cover story that humans are designed to exercise, and they are. If we look at hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers are people who live today as Stone Ages did 30,000 years ago. And the average hunter-gatherer walks about 9 to 11 miles a day. And in addition, anything that has to be lifted or pushed or pulled is done by hand. There are no labor-saving devices. And this is why they are lean and healthy. And if we look at the leading causes of death, and you can take the 10 or 12 or 15, virtually every single one, almost none of them have anything to do with aging by itself. If we look at all those causes of death and things like osteoporosis, they are lifestyle related and not age related. And one example that I use <coughs> is if we look at at the fossil bones of Stone Agers from 30,000 years ago, we can date them pretty well. Their bones, even when they reach their 60s or 70s, are still thick and strong. If we look at today's hunter-gatherers, about 20% of whom reach the age of 70, for, for instance, their bones are thick and strong. And yet, many of them have very little in the way of nutrients like calcium, which we think is so important. And one of the things about exercise is that 
when you exercise a muscle, it pulls against the bone to which, it, which it's attached. That stresses the bone. The bone reacts by getting thicker and stronger. And this is why people who exercise regularly have thick, strong bones. Now, for people who say, well, I walk every day, I walk three or four miles, or I run, I tell people not not to stop doing that because that's important for your heart and lungs and getting some vitamin D, et cetera. But you also have to use resistance exercises, which means things like uh, barbells, dumbbells, uh, elastic bands, machines, to stress every muscle in your body. And I mean every muscle in your body from your feet on up. And by doing that, it makes your entire uh, skeleton stronger. One of the things that people fail to realize with exercise is, uh, is that it makes so much a huge difference in everything else that you do. For instance, by exercising and increasing your heart rate, your heart pumps harder, pumps blood more vigorously through your body, opens up blood vessels that often lie dormant if they're not being used, stretch the blood vessels on a daily basis so they maintain their elasticity so they don't get what we call hardening of the arteries because exercise keeps them supple. And when you look at books like the one written by Daniel Ahmed, for instance, uh, he has a book uh, called uh, Better Brain, um, Better Body. It, it's very well written. And if you look at every section of that book, Exercise plays a role in every element of health that he discusses, hmm. with no exceptions. We just can't do it exercising every day, and yet only about one person out of five in this country exercises enough to work up a sweat for 30 to 60 minutes. And that's really what our bodies are designed for. We are designed for that kind of activity, and we don't have that kind of activity there's a cascade of obesity, type 2 diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, all these things that we blame on aging, which cause all those annoyances, and yet are not. Now, there are some things that aging brings with it. You know, fragile skin, for instance, okay. Thinning hair, wrinkles. But when it comes to things like muscular activity and heart strength and bone strength, it's not aging that does us in. Not until we reach our 90s or 100s, hmm. at which point wow. muscle cells begin to deteriorate be just because of, of age. But up until then, we should be vigorous in our 80s and 90s. So people that argue the genetics you're going to get your, you're prone to these diseases because of genetics? Are you saying that's, there's a... Oh, very definitely. People say, well, I've had so many obese people in my family, I've got fat genes. Well, that, yeah, that I don't... <laughs> I have fat genes. <laughs> and the reason I know that is when I went through a period of several months with virtually no activity, I gained about 25 pounds. Wow. My mother came to visit. And she pinched my cheek, she said, Phil, you look so good. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true. Uh, even those people who have genes, uh, many, we all have genes for obesity, like 50 or 60. But even those of us who have a genetic tendency toward obesity and type 2 diabetes and heart disease and stroke, those things don't happen unless we follow a lifestyle that allows those genes to take over and produce those results. So I'm just, uh, give us a little bit more background on who y you are and how you got into this and the books you've written. Well, people wonder how a pediatrician could spend so much time talking to seniors. <laughs> we asked you that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, when I was in pediatrics, I began to notice that the parents of my patients were often overweight and obese. So I got interested in this issue of how we become this way. And this was just when the epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes were beginning to accelerate. And after doing a good deal of reading and you know, just following one track after another, I came across a, a wonderful book called Paleolithic Prescription.
Hmm. The book described how people in the Stone Age didn't have lifestyle diseases, even though we, their descendants, do have them. And they pointed out it was because of, number one, physical activity, and number two, diet. Because back in the Stone Age, there weren't the refined sugars, no there refined weren't the sugars, fast foods. No. They didn't no, have McDonald's. No, they, didn't <laughs> have, they didn't have salt shakers. No. <laughs> they probably they won't didn't get fried by things. McDonald's anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you they can go salad. to. They have salads. That, that's right. You can go to McDonald's and eat pretty well. Um, and what I found was that when we get, began to explore this whole concept of aging, the diseases of aging were not diseases of aging. They were diseases of inactivity and a bizarre diet, a really bizarre diet. When you realize that back in the Stone Age, they had no cereal grains. Hmm. I mean, they had some, but it took so much effort to gather them, to prepare them, and cook them, and they didn't have the control of fire as we do now. They didn't have utensils to cook things. They didn't bother with grains. Um, and then they didn't have any dairy products whatsoever. I mean, you can't milk a mammoth very easily. <laughs> okay. well, and we didn't have either cereal grains or dairy products until about 10 to 12,000 years ago. After that, within a generation or two of any hunter-gatherer culture becoming farmers, agriculturalists, we began to see much greater infant mortality, mm. m a shorter stature, mm. uh, bone diseases, tooth diseases, things which didn't occur just a few generations earlier and was only because of mainly diet. Another factor was because when people gathered into villages and began to be farmers, they usually settled near water. They didn't know anything about hygiene. That's when a whole raft of new diseases, waterborne diseases, sewage-borne oh. diseases began to take over. And everything changed at that point. We were no longer healthy. We were sedentary, eating foods that we were not designed for, living in circumstances that our immune systems had difficulty with. And we see it now. Interesting. <laughs> well, well, we also hear, speaking of diet and how mm -hmm. important diet is, you know, I eat organic and oh, you know, everything I buy is organic and all, everything that's organic actually costs more mm -hmm. and... Are you talking about you personally? Or yeah, you me personally. So no, you ate a lot of candy over the holidays. <laughs> yeah, I did over the holidays. <laughs> um, but, so, mm. it's funny because recently I bought or not recently, but in the past, I've bought organic chicken breast versus just boneless chicken breast. All the organic chicken breasts that I've bought, and I've done it multiple times just to keep trying, are really tough. And it's like, okay, what did they feed this chicken that they didn't feed the other chicken? It, is organic really as important as everybody's making it out to be, or is this the newest gimmick, or... Is this the way for the manufacturers to make a little more money by labeling it organic? Mm -hmm. What's your opinion? Organic is a can of worms because there are several kinds of organic. Even the government has different categories of organic. The challenge with organic is it's often abused. The term is abused by marketers. Sure. And organic food in general may not taste better. It's not because it's organic that tomatoes taste so bad these days. It's because of the way they're, they're processed and genetically developed to be nice and round so that machines can pick them. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in the, the designing of fruits and vegetables that machinery can harvest instead of men, they breed out nutrition and they breed out flavor. And this is shown in an excellent book, one I recommend all the time, by <coughs> a woman named Joe Robinson. Um, Joe Robinson uh, wrote a book called Eating on the Wild Side. Excellent book. And she points out that over the last 50, 75 years, 
these changes in agricultural pro processes have made it easier to produce food that is less nutritious. And she gives example after example of that. Now, the good side about the book is that she also describes those varieties of fruits and vegetables that still maintain their nutrition and flavor. Oh, okay. But the example that I use is tomatoes. For instance, have you ever grown your own tomatoes? Yes. Not me. Okay. They're all the same size and shape, right? Never. Isn't that interesting? But when you go to the supermarket, they're all little they're round all balls. <laughs> the same size and shape. Because if they're all different sizes, the machine couldn't pick them all, and there'd be a lot of wastage. So they're bred to be the same size and shape so they can be harvested properly. Wow. And in doing that, you breed out nutrients. And agricultural colleges have been following this for decades, and they have found decreases in certain um, uh, nutrients like zinc, iron, protein, et cetera, that have de decreased by more than 70%, more than 70% wow. in 50 years because of the way we design our products. So I'm going to put you on the spot. What does your diet consist ah, of? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes I'm invited to uh, speak at a buffet lunch. <laughs> and of course, they always ask me to get in line first. <laughs> <laughs> to see what you're going to put on your plate. <laughs> and then when I sit down, some, no matter where people are in the audience, they always manage to come by my table <laughs> to see what I have on my, on my plate. <laughs> but yeah, my wife and I eat a sensible diet. Number one, she's an excellent cook, uh, which helps a lot. Uh, but also, we tend to avoid uh, starchy uh, foods. Uh, we have very little uh, sugar in our diet. Uh, my breakfast consists of either a, a protein shake with some uh, piece of fruit, maybe a little bit of juice, uh, or as I did today, since I didn't want to take the time to make a protein shake, I had uh, some uh, a cantaloupe and uh, yogurt, fat-free yogurt, and a cup of coffee. And I feel perfectly satisfied at that. Uh, one of the benefits of that is I have given up cereals. Uh, one of the reasons for giving up breakfast cereal was because I have prediabetes. Mm. Because I have a family history of, fa of diabetes, unavoidable. But I have been prediabetic for more than 25 years, never crossed the line. And I measure my blood sugars on a regular basis. You know, for 10 days at a time, every three to four months. And the reason is because my body fat is down about 12% because I don't stuff myself. Um, kind of frustrating for my wife who's a good cook because I sometimes <laughs> don't eat the <laughs> entire meal. I said, I just don't not have that person much appetite. Wife. And I'm, I have trained myself not to eat a lot, never stuff myself. The Okinawans have a, a saying only eat until you're 80% full. Okinawans are the longest lived people on the planet. That is not an accident. They, they only eat uh, meat occasionally. When they prepare pork, for instance, which is common in, in Okinawa, they boil it for hours so all the fat is gone. They're getting essentially nothing but, but protein in that meat. But it's that kind of lifestyle. They don't have sugar. Everything they do is done by hand. It's a poor prefecture, so they <coughs> right, don't have the mechanization that other areas of Japan do. And that's one of the keys. Right? Oh. So in terms of diet, um, lunch What would you consider a balanced diet? Ah, okay. A balanced diet is one that, number one, eliminates certain things to make it balanced, and that is refined grains, refined sugars, uh, minimal amounts of fat, and the fat in a diet should be monounsaturated as in olive oil, or omega-3 fats as is found in fish or fish oil. Um, saturated fat doesn't have the bad uh, rep that it used to have. It's not quite as dangerous as, as we used to think, but it's not the necessarily the kind of fat but the amount of fat, I mean, you can have a little bit of saturated fat and not 
mess up your cholesterol, your risk of heart disease or stroke. But when you have a large intake of saturated fat, then you're looking at a lot of calories. It's the calories that add to obesity. It's the obesity that brings on all the other problems. And one of the reasons why obesity is a problem and why I tend to keep my body weight down is that obesity, uh, I, uh, fat doesn't just sit there. Fat produces what are called cytokines, chemicals that promote inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation is one of the keys to coronary artery disease, mm -hmm. stroke, diabetes, osteoporosis, MS, uh, thyroiditis, inflammatory processes, rheumatoid arthritis. So that if you maintain low uh, percentage of body fat, you are then subjecting your body to lower amounts of inflammatory chemicals, therefore you're less likely to have all these diseases. And the prime example is shown in a book by Dan Butner, which I'm sure you've heard about, The, the Blue Zones. Uh, there are five areas of the world where people become super centenarians. They reach the levels at the age of 105, 107, 110 or more, and they are vigorous and active and healthy. And interesting enough, supercentenarians don't die of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke. Hmm. They die of things like pneumonia because the immune system eventually begins to poop out. Something that was discovered fairly recently is that one of the reasons they die of heart failure at that age is because heart muscle is replaced, the protein of heart muscle is replaced by amyloid. Oh. which also occurs in the brain of yep. Alzheimer's, as you know, yep. but it occurs in other areas. When heart tissue uh, is replaced by amyloid, it pumps less effectively, lead to heart failure, this, and that in turn makes it more, the person more susceptible to pneumonia. So at the age of 510, you're likely to die of heart failure or pneumonia or combination of two, but you won't die of diabetes. Dr. Phil, we, we've gone, I could, this is like my favorite topic. <laughs> so we're just going to do a really some quick little okay. jabs of questions. Mm -hmm. Flu shot or no flu shot? Mm. You're, yes or no? Flu shot, yes. Okay, <coughs> flu shot, yes. It doesn't work 100%. Nothing works 100%. But if you, uh, if you get the flu shot, even though it doesn't protect you completely from the flu, <coughs> your illness is likely not to be serious enough to be put in the hospital. And the worst place you can be yeah. these days is, is in a the hospital. hospital. <laughs> and then, and then, <coughs> where can people see you or get a? Hold, you have a website. Let the people know how to get a hold of you if you would like that. Yeah, I have a, a website, uh, www.stoneagedoc.com. Okay. And every two weeks, I, uh, I publish a uh, a blog. I did one last night. <coughs> and I have it's two components, actually three. The first of the month, I list the places where I'll be giving a presentation. And in each section, every two weeks, I have one on something that's in the news. And lately, the keto diet has been in the news. And another section is on some lifestyle component. And a few months ago, I, had, I went through the list of 10 ways to prevent dementia. Every couple of weeks was hmm. one more. Now I am doing uh, the annoyances of aging, of which there are about 18 annoyances of aging that we wish we didn't have to face. <coughs> and so I'm serializing that as well. Uh, but I, I welcome people uh, to write or to, um, to contact me in any way. I just love talking about this issue. Yeah, no, because right. there's so much that we can do that we're not doing, which just frustrates me so much. Well, if you have nothing to do on Sunday, she's going to be running the uh, Carlsbad Half Marathon. Oh, that's right. <laughs> wow. So let's wish her luck on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. <laughs> what time does that start, Patty? Uh, it's actually a late start. The half starts at 7.45. The full starts at 6.15. 6.15. But the old green mare oh. doesn't do the full oh. anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, remember what I said about running <laughs> being a sport, not an exercise. Right, uh, right. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Well, Dr. <coughs> Phil, thank you so much for coming on today. As I say, you are, you are what don't eat to, li eat to live, don't live to eat, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And uh, again, I wish we could get 
I go to the gym, as, uh -huh. and Patty goes, Patty's a gym rat, I'm mm. a gym rat, and uh, we Excellent. swear by Excellent. that whole process. So we would so, love the whole world to hear this and, and get mm -hmm. out there and do some exercise every day. Oh, absolutely. So. It's, it's so critical. So, so thank you, Dr. Phil, for being here. Oh, Patty, 2020, here we go. Yep. Uh -huh. And we thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, this is Ron Greenwald, my business partner, Patty Gerke, Senior Stay or Go. Please look at on our website and look for where we'll be hanging out this year, as well as Dr. Phil. And write us, email us, get a hold of us, and we'll put you in contact with the right people for the highest quality of life. Thanks for being with us today.